The Bob Murphy Show, episode 224. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here's your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. Today I'm gonna be talking with Patrick Newman, whose new book is titled Cronyism, Liberty Versus Power in Early America, 1607 to 1849. And let me just give you a little bit of the bio for Patrick. He's been on the show before. I'll link in the show notes page to his previous appearance. But Dr. Patrick Newman is a fellow of the Mises Institute, and he's assistant professor of economics at Florida Southern College and a fellow of its Center for Free Enterprise. He got his PhD in economics at George Mason University. And he's the editor of Murray Rothbard's The Progressive Era, which the Mises Institute put out in 2017. He also edited and helped get published Rothbard's so-called lost fifth volume of his collection, Conceived in Liberty, The New Republic, 1784 to 1791. And so it, so that's what we talked about largely in the last interview. In this one, I'll have Patrick in the beginning, he gives a commercial in case you want to go see the last one and you hadn't caught it the first time around. So without further ado, here is my discussion with Patrick on his new book, which again is about cronyism in early American history. Well, Patrick, welcome back to the Bob Murphy Show. Thanks for having me on. So let me give just a quick commercial for the, uh, the previous appearance you've made here. You, amongst your other accomplishments, you cracked the code, right? You you figured out how to uh, decipher. It's it's sort of like uh, the, the the Da Vinci Code, you know. And yeah. You were, and you were Tom Hanks, and I guess Rothbard was Da Vinci. Yeah. And so, do you want to just very quickly just give like a little teaser, or commercial, and I'll and so folks, of course, at BobMurphyShow dot com slash two two four, I'll have the links to this. So if if Patrick entices you to go listen to that story, we won't rehash it here, but just extremely quickly, you you deciphered the code. Yeah, sure. So this, I, I learned a new language, Rothbardanese, uh, for the fifth volume of Conceived in Liberty, Murray Rothbard's five-volume series on early American history. Uh, he wrote a fifth volume. He hand-wrote it on the 1780s and on the Constitution, but no one could read his handwriting. So a couple of years back, I learned how to read his handwriting. I basically deciphered it. And yeah, the, the Conceived in Liberty, Volume 5, came out in 2019. So it's always funny sometimes when I introduce myself at various events, if it was a pork fest or free freedom fest, they say, oh, you're the guy who, who, who knows Rothbard's handwriting, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's my, that's my claim to fame. I've cracked the code. Yes. But in a, but it is critical because like you say, he had a whole manuscript for a, a vo- book, you know, a volume in his series that, you know, so it's not just like, you know, he had a shopping list. He was writing for his wife or something. I mean, it was, yeah, it was it was a full book, and this was this was different than the Progressive Era, a book I also edited, which it was an unfinished manuscript. That one was typed, but this one, I mean, had a beginning and an end. This was this is a, a self contained book, and yeah, it's quite incredible because I don't think anyone had read it since Rothbard wrote it. So you're literally deciphering. It's like new knowledge. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it was it was it was it was a thrilling experience. Uh, it was it was tough, but I was I was very happy uh, that I did it. Okay, great. So again, folks, bobmurphyshow.com slash 224, and I'll put all the links for this stuff, including the last time I had Patrick on, we told the full story about that. But today we're discussing Patrick's newest book, which is called Cronyism, Liberty Versus Power in Early America, 1607 to 1849. You have it right there, right, Patrick? Do you want to hold it up? For the yeah, YouTube. sure. I've got it right here. This yep. is the paperback version. So for get on Amazon. Who are right looking there. at the YouTube? By the way, let me just mention as a side, folks. If you listen just to these audio interviews, typically we have video as well, and so you just go to the show notes page, and I give you the the YouTube link. Okay, so I had discussed this with Patrick before we started recording. I think, folks, to let him get a chance to tell all of you what's in this book, but also to keep your interest. Hi, we'll just go through and I'll just throw out some 
topics that I think U.S. listeners in particular will uh, resonate with, Patrick, if that's all right. But yeah. before we do that, why don't we step back and w- why why this particular topic and this time period? And, you know, was this your idea or were you approached? How did, how did this book come to be? Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. So in the fall of 2018, Hunter Lewis, uh, he had written some books on crony capitalism. He's also uh, affiliated with the Mises Institute. He approached me. He wanted he wanted me to write a book on the history of crony capitalism. And I was delighted that he asked me to do this. So I said I could start working on this once I was done with the fifth volume of Conceived in Liberty. So I started the book in the spring of 2019, basically finished it by the early winter of 2021. And then the book's now out. So this book, he wanted a book on crony capitalism. I just focused on the name cronyism. Uh, So yeah, this is a, it's a book on the history of cronyism, really concentrating on early American history. When we think of cronyism, it's really special interest policies, right? Traditionally, when politicians advocate legislation, it's it's always in the public interest. It's always that we need an infrastructure bill because the market will underprovide it and this will provide all sorts of benefits. You don't look into the fact how politicians and various uh, construction companies, et cetera, are profiting off of this. Same thing with central banking, tariffs, whatever you want to call it. And so I trace the history of this legislation, these types of policies uh, in American history. I show that a lot of signature legislation, things that you're usually taught in a traditional high school history class, et cetera, are actually the result of cronyism. And I explain it using this liberty versus power theory of Murray Rothbard, which argues that history is sort of a struggle or a clash between the forces of liberty and the forces of power. Forces of liberty are anti-cronyism, they're free market. Forces of power are pro-cronyism, right? Uh, They're anti-free market. They're big government. So in early American history, this is something that's hard for a lot of modern libertarians to understand because when we think of libertarianism now, it's kind of like a fringe sort of third party uh, element. You kind of got to morph and do, you know, you either got to do your own thing uh, politically or try and work within one of the major parties. I show that in early American history, uh, the Jeffersonians and Jacksonians, as well as the anti-federalists, they were significant libertarians. So there was a genuine mass movement dedicated to fighting special privileges. And when they had control of the government, special privileges declined, right? When the forces of power, Hamiltonians, Federalists, Whigs, et cetera, had control of the government, cronyism increases. Uh, The dynamic gets more complicated because when the forces of liberty control the government, over time, they get corrupted by power, and then they start to increase their own privileges. This is the, the issue with why it's so hard to actually achieve meaningful reform. But anyway, I discuss this in my book. I go through the early American history, and it's really a kind of no st- stone is left unturned, no special interest connection is left uh, you know, undiscovered. I always try and name names and do all that good stuff people are very interested in. Okay, great. Well, that, that's a great summary. Um, I did want to ask you about that. I um, on the the term itself. I know some people don't like the term crony capitalism because they say, "Well, no, if it's cronyism, it's not capitalism." Like capitalism, by definition, means the genuine free market, respect for property rights. If there is a government, you know, if we're not looking at Rothbardian land, but uh, yeah. a, a, a smaller government, you know, but then capitalism, you know, in the sense of like what Mises conceived of then there wouldn't be cronyism in there by definition. And so they don't like the term crony capitalism, but whereas other people are like, well, come on, we're, we, you know, we need something to denote the partnership between business and government that's not quite outright fascism. And so that's, right. so anyway, do you, because anyway, you mentioned, because originally Hunter Lewis is, was thinking of his crony capitalism, you just called it cronyism. Was that partly why you guys used that title was just to avoid that fight? Yeah, in in a sense, yeah, because I I know I I myself am not I like I prefer the term cronyism. Mm-hmm. It feels more encompassing, and it's less an indictment of capitalism per se, uh, and it's more just focusing on kind of the, the special interest connection, some sort of some sort of relationship between a politician, a business, or another interest group. So I yeah, I really don't use the term crony capitalism that much in the book. I briefly talk about America's sort of capitalist growth, Mm -hmm. but I try and keep that separate. So yeah, I prefer the term cronyism Mm -hmm. uh, or just, you know, crony, right? That's, that's me. Yeah. So that, that's why I focus on um, that. And also because a lot of cronies, in my opinion, is is sort of political based. 
uh, either with things like elections or you know re- something with with either redistricting or mm-hmm. or whatever. And that that is all linked uh, is a try and show, and so it's not necessarily capitalist like just dealing with the market. So yeah, it was an intentional decision on my part to okay. not use the word capital. Right. Okay, great. And then also before we dive into the specifics, these you know various historical topics, let me ask you, because it, it really was something I was going to ask anyway, and you you kind of went right into it. The, the, the subtitle, you know, Liberty versus Power, and you explicitly mentioned how that was the framework that Rothbard would use. He even did it, folks, just as an aside, um, not just with historical events, but also, or, you know, trends and things like that, but even in the history of economic thought, that's a major lens through which Rothbard, you know, would analyze past thinkers was, you know, how much did this particular economist or proto-economist, if it was, you know, somebody like David Hume or something, uh, you know, their writings, did they support liberty versus where, you know, would their writings and their, their theoretical structures be, you know, supporting statism, let's call it. Um, so, I'm curious, Patrick, I've heard two schools of thought that one is in the foil being like the Marxist. So the Marxist conception of history looks at, oh yeah, it's a struggle between the different economic classes. You know, there's the bourgeoisie and then there's the, you know, the proletariat. And that's the lens through which somebody who is more like into racial politics might look at the past and see everything in the, through the lens of whatever the the white oppressor class and the uh, indigenous peoples and the enslaved uh, black population, things like that. Whereas, so one type of response to the leftist doing that is to say, Hey, that's, we, we shouldn't have the, this, this framework, like the good guys and the bad guys. When we look at history, just, you know, be a historian neutral and don't have your moral baggage with you. Whereas Rothbard is, saying, no, it's okay to have good guys and bad guys. Just get, get the yeah. teams right. Yeah. So is that, yeah. so number one, do you agree with what I just said? And then two, do you want to comment on, you know, that, that dispute? Yeah, sure. So I, I take the Roth, I take the, well, I take, I guess I could say one, you should understand history when you do the good guys versus bad guys. Uh, I do actually adhere to that approach. I, I agree with Rothbard, you know, you want to make sure, just make sure you get the teams right, but you also want to judge people from contemporary standards is in like, in, is in the past, right? So you don't want to, there are plenty of people who in the past we would consider ethically very, you know, reprehensible now if they owned slaves or if they believed in, you know, uh, very blatant uh, dis- discrimination between, you know, between uh, men and women, you know, bl- all sorts of stuff. But that's not, it's not the fair, it's not an appropriate way to actually look at history because someone 50 to 100 years from now can be looking back on us and say, oh my God, how did they hold these views that now we we realize in the year, tw- you know, 2100 or whatever that, you know, that that's outdated. So you do want to, look at the history and kind of analyze struggles, but using it in the actual, what contemporary people uh, considered good or bad or what they were sort of fighting for. Uh, And I also do like Rothbard. I I agree that it it explains history of thought. I actually tie in the growth of cronyism in the United States, economic thinkers, they did matter. Uh, So a lot of people, a lot of the, uh, the, the, the forces of Liberty, they were very influenced by free market. Uh, thinkers such as Adam Smith. Then you even have guys like David Ricardo, John Baptiste Say, uh, Frederick Bastiat, etc. And then the forces of power, uh, Hamilton, you know, very influenced by mercantilist thinkers and other proponents of what would later be called the American system. So that is certainly something that fits into my uh, my, my, my overall narrative. But yeah, I, I, I think the actual class struggle, you know, the way of looking at it, you've got some sort of exploitation, et cetera, between groups. I think that's actually appropriate, provided that we're using the correct theory to do this. If we think about it, class analysis or the Marxist class analysis that really began with the libertarians. They were the first ones in the 1800s to really sort of develop this type of class analysis. Particularly, I think the it was Charles Compton and Charles Dunier, I think something, those names, they used it basically the, the exploiters, those people linked with the government, and the exploited, so the, the market. The Marxists came after that, and they said, well, you also have to add the capitalist in there. So then you've got the government, the capitalists. And then, you know, the workers and then the government kind of fell out and it became sort of this battle between the capitalists and the workers, which is really a perversion of the of the true sort of class analysis. The correct one, in my opinion, which is you have to look at people's relationship to the government. So there is definitely that type of 
exploitation analysis that is appropriate, but it's important to realize that exploitation is not endemic to the market, but it's due to uh, government intervening in the market. Okay, great. Um, why don't we, you, you've got your, um, this, this opening quotation that I guess is going to be the theme for the book from Lord Acton, 1887, and everybody knows the end of this quote, but let me read you know, more of the, what you've got here, and then I'll have you comment on it just to give more of the context. So this is Lord Acton, 1887, saying, I cannot accept your canon with just one, well, <laughs> two ends, but split up, not, not, the, uh, not a weapon. I cannot accept your canon that we are to judge Pope and King, unlike other men, with a favorable presumption that they did no wrong. If there is any presumption, it is the other way against holders of power, increasing as the power increases. And there's an ellipsis. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so there, I assume Pope and King, because they have capitals, are referring to the positions, not to someone named Pope and someone named King. Yeah, yeah. Because at yeah. first I thought, like, oh, is he talking about Alexander Pope? And then I realized, oh, no, he's talking about. So, again, just the, the big picture, he's. Do you know, is he writing a letter to somebody? Is that what that is? Yeah, he's right. He's writing a letter. This is, yeah, it's like this is, is most easily his most famous line at the end. And so it's it wasn't in a letter. tweet. No, yeah, it was not a tweet. Uh, I don't think they had Twitter back then, but I have to, I could be wrong. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was, just, I always love this quote. And it really does explain the, in the entire book. Um, so I don't know, were you going to say something else? I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, well, just, so what he's, what drove him to say power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely is he's telling someone that his correspondent presumably was saying that, hey, we shouldn't have a higher stand or it was even going the other way and saying, hey, the pope or the king get to do things that other mere mortals can't because of their exalted position. And Lord Acton was saying, no, on the contrary, we should hold them to a higher standard of behavior because power tends to corrupt. Is, is that well, well, right. So what he was getting at was, was, was basically when you, when you look at actual history, we have a tendency to look favorably upon great men, so to speak, the important people and, oh, they're great. You know, they're very, they're very important. So that means they must be doing good. But, you know, he's explaining that, well, actually you have to look at them differently because they have a lot of power. And when you have power, they tend to, you know, you tend to get corrupted by power. So, one of the things to sort of unpack and when, especially because in my book, I use the word corruption a lot. There is uh, back in the day in the 1700s, 1800s, people r routinely referred to this corruption of power, right? This was something that was very big among the libertarians back in the day. It was very big in politics. So it's the fact that you get corrupted. There is undeniably partially a moral element of that or something that's unethical. But the big focus is what they were really kind of getting at was that they were they were using the government to benefit themselves. They were using the government for their own ends or to benefit their supporters, et cetera. Because in my book, I describe how, you know, corruption by power is really your is an in, in more economics terms. It's an increased incentive to engage in cronyism. Right. Because when you take office or if you win election, what we would see throughout American history is you might be riding on a you know, running, excuse me, on a very pro reform campaign saying that, oh, we've got to downsize government. We've got to do all this, et cetera. And then when you get in control of the government, you say, well, you know, there's an election in two years or, you know, actually, I don't want to pass this policy because that will alienate these supporters. Uh, or actually, now I need to grant this favor to this group because they're going to be important in the future for this coalition building. So you you inevitably, and this happened with Thomas Jefferson, uh, you, you you start to get corrupted by power. You 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 do make some reforms, but over time you start to increase. Uh, you you start to pass your own forms of cronyism, and this is this is a recurring issue that it's very hard to get rid of the government or to downsize the government because in order to do so, you have to take control of the government, but when you take control of the government, you get corrupted by the government, right? This is the classic like DC swamp aspect, mm -hmm. right? Where mm -hmm. it's like, you're going to have people, well, I'm going to reform DC. And then, you know, it doesn't happen. Right. And why is that? Well, in a sense, at least early Americans would say you got corrupted by power. And that's something that I think holds true, uh, not only in the past, but also in the present. Yeah. Let me tell a quick story. If you don't mind, Patrick, uh, oh, of course. this is, um, 
I, I think I've told it a few times on the podcast, folks, but it's been a while, so it's okay. Uh, so back in the day, I wrote a proposal or not a, propo- a, a paper, a study for Pacific Research Institute or PRI on a flat tax for California. And yes, I had some ethical qualms. People can judge me if they want. It was like, because it, it had to be revenue neutral. So it got rid of loopholes and stuff to bring the rate down. But, you know, yeah. in, there were some people that technically, if this thing went through, would, their taxes would have been raised. And so that's not good. And, you know, nowadays I wouldn't endorse that. But that's what I did at the time, this proposal. But, and, of course, the, the study mostly just talked about the benefits of lower marginal tax rates and blah, blah, blah. Okay. So some, I won't name names, but this California, this freshman California GOP congressman, you know, so at the state level, got a hold of this study and he really loved it. And he had me, you know, fly out there and, and go to his office in California and, you know, meet with him and his chief of staff. And he, he really wanted to do something with this. You know, he wanted to introduce legislation based on this study because I, yeah, I convinced him. And I'll say folks, he, he really was a true believer. Like, again, he was, this was, he was newly elected. He, I don't know if he'd been an entrepreneur or something, but a younger guy. And he, and he really, I could just tell from his commentary and like him flipping through and sit talking to me, he understood it, like the economics behind it. And so we're sitting in this meeting and I'm all excited, like, oh, wow, someone's actually taking me seriously. My work is going to make a difference. And his chief of staff just over the course of like a 10 minutes of just talking to him and I'm sitting there listening, was telling him, you know, this Jim or whatever the guy's name was, it's, you know, this, you're not even going to get this out of committee. Like the, the other Republicans that you're on this committee with, I don't remember what it was called, you know, the Fisk Finance or something. This isn't even going to get voted out of committee because it's too radical and all that's going to happen. So it's not going to do anything. And when you go up for reelection in two years, your opponent in the general is going to, perhaps even in the primary, is going to hold this against you and just, you know, say that you had this crazy plan, you know, some from far right-wing academic kook, blah, 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 blah. And and he convinced the guy, and the guy, by the end of it, was like, well, Dr. Murphy, thanks for coming out. We'll be in touch. And I never heard from him again. And the uh-huh. thing was, the chief of staff wasn't wrong. Like, he had convinced me by the end of it. I was like, oh, yeah, this, this isn't going to go anywhere. And so I was, it, it was just interesting that, it's not merely that like the people get corrupt. It's like the system is set up so that even somebody who does go there, you know, with good intentions and wants to reform it, it's just, it's not going to happen. Like the system is designed and, you know, you know, if you, especially if you go to Washington, obviously it's way worse and more cutthroat that if you want to get on the relevant committees, you know, the ones that are, that are coveted because there's a lot of money flowing through or whatever, then you got to play the game. You got to make sure that, you know, you're, if you know the majority leader likes you and you vote certain ways on these other important bills, the whips going around and getting all the votes lined up for. And if you don't, then you're not going to get on those good committees. And so even if you keep getting reelected from your constituents, the power structure there can make sure you don't do anything. So anyway, that was my quick story. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's exactly, it's exactly, it's, it's it's sort of um, an example of this where, yeah, the system is, it's really hard to actually reform. The only way I kind of talk about this in the book and I provide some, some sort of historical examples, the the only real way you can sort of reform the system is if you actually try and like break away from it. So things involving nullification, secession, bringing things down more on the state and local level, those aren't perfect by any means, but it's extremely hard to actually reform the entrenched systems of power in state capitals and in, in the federal capital. I mean, it's just, it's, 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 it's really just not going to – just because the way it's built in and the people who, who run there, they end up getting corrupted or they just drop their initial campaign pledges and whatever. You always have to look ahead to the next election and all sorts of power, you know, the, the committees and, and all of that. Yeah, it's, it's extreme. Um, it's the incentive structure. It's brutal. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so chapter two is talking about the American Revolutionary War, the triumph of liberty – and the last um, topic in it, you know, in terms of the table of contents, is the libertarianism of the revolution. So can you talk on that? Because I've seen there's at least two schools of thought from modern day libertarians or people who are libertarian friendly. On the one hand, they look at the revolution as, ah, yes, the triumph of liberty versus power, to use your subtitle. Whereas other ones say, no, actually the American revolution, we should, we should look at that kind of like the French revolution, but not as bad. And that this was the triumph of the growth of the state. And let's, 
hey, just if you if you don't you know don't take my word for it, look right now. The U.S. government is the global, you know, the the, the this has runs a global empire. And we're all pining for, oh, remember when we used to have freedom in this country? And so what are you talking about? This is the system that they gave us. And, you know, and and yeah. also like if you're a hoppy and you got some issues with democracy versus like aristocracy and things like that. And so, uh-huh. you know, shouldn't we view the like what violently breaking away from the king? And, and what are you talking about? Like wouldn't it have been better to just have these colonies that have an ocean in, in between them and the and the king and, you know, that kind of stuff? Yeah, so the, the, the especially the the American Revolution, which used to be you know back in the day when you go to you go to school. I grew up in New Jersey, so I remember my town. Actually, we had a tree. Most recently, got it got recently got taken down. Actually, made the Wall Street Journal news. This is a tree George Washington ate lunch under. You're right, mm-hmm. and it's like, and you learn about your American Revolution. You're like, yeah, this is our time. And when I was in elementary school, that's when um, uh, the Patriot had come out. Like, yeah, there yeah, you go, yeah. Mel Gibson. You're like, yeah, you know, and everything. And mm. and and now the American Revolution isn't is is held in very low regard, especially with with a lot of the the growth of crit- things like critical race theory, etc. And I know there's been various free market economists who have criticized the American Revolution. I side with uh, scholars like Murray Rothbard as well as Jeff Hummel that the American Revolution had uh, provided tremendous benefits. Right. So outside of the fact that we now created a separate government and we we seceded, we broke away, which is really the first instance of colonies really rebelling against what was a world superpower in beating them, which was like a tremendous upset and that this allowed greater decentralization, there's, there's other benefits you have to look into, right? You have to look at, which is one with the American revolution. Uh, you saw a, a very strong breakdown of existing systems of feudalism in the United States. So, uh, when the colonies were created, uh, the various, um, the, the Royal, uh, the, the Royal government, Britain gave out these various, uh, states, like these land grants to their favorite supporters. You had people working on them, even though those people homesteaded the land, they didn't own the land technically. So uh, particularly in New York, you saw a tremendous uh, breakup of these feudal states and sort of divided amongst what we would consider as libertarians, the rightful owners. This was a very big thing because it also just released more resources into uh, the, the private sector to be used. So you had the breakup of, of, uh, of feudalism. You also saw a, a tremendous move towards religious liberty uh, in in the colonies, right? And this was particularly through uh, breaking what was known as the alliance of throne and altar. So having like a a, a government established church, okay, uh, like the Anglican Church, and of course the Anglican Church would say uh, the, the the you know the the Brit- British the the British monarch is divine. You have to listen to them, et cetera, et cetera, and that just became basically a justification. Uh, or quasi propaganda for uh, the you know various government intervention. So that was big, just having religious freedom and really that separation of church and state, which is an important aspect uh, to basically break away the intellectuals from the government. You did also see greater um, uh, suffrage granted. So uh, I, at least during this time period, I'm actually very pro democracy because I think it was done primarily through local and state means, and this is a way of people. Uh, you know, cycling out elites. There's a there's a, a, a firm tradition of rotation in office, so you couldn't have entrenched politicians. So allowing more people to 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 vote, or at least to be to be able to vote. Traditionally, it was granted only to people who held a certain amount of property, which sort of entrenched kind of an oligarchy. So there was that. It also did lead to revolutions in Europe of people rebelling against various European monarchs in the 1780s, leading up to the French Revolution. French Revolution could have been successful. The issue was feudalism, mercantilism, and sort of absolutism was just too entrenched there. And for a variety of other reasons, it really took a a turn for the worse. But just having people stand up to their rulers, that was very important. And an additional point, and this is something that uh, should be emphasized in this day and age, is that the, 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 the American Revolution did accelerate the end of slavery. Uh, at least the the, the 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 end of slavery in various parts of the uh, of of in the, you know, the the now thirteen independent states, you had the North uh, strong decrease in slavery there, as well as also in the in the South. Excuse me for a moment. Um, in the South, particularly in Virginia and North Carolina, 
many, uh, many slaves were emancipated, et cetera. And this was a tremendous, um, uh, basically boost. So it did weaken slavery. So there were a variety of reasons why the American Revolution did have libertarian um, uh, uh, consequences. And I think it's important to talk about those, which is I talk about that in my book. Oh, that, that last point is interesting because I don't want to quote them or, or attribute views specifically, but the one of the people, the founders of the 1619 Project I, th- I think, well, you know, one of their ideas is, is to uh, say that the American Revolution was partly to shore up slavery, that they could read the writing on the wall and knew that, oh, the way Great Britain's going, you know, they're going um, yeah. out, to you know, outlaw yeah. slavery eventually. Yeah, so, that- and so the way we, we protect our peculiar institution is to break away from, in other words, just like what the standard view taught in a lot of classes about what the U S civil war was all about. They were she was arguing that. Yeah. That, that, that has become very big now to describe. There was, I forget the case, but there was some court case in Britain that, um, in like the 1760s or the 1770s before the American revolution that, um, you know, it it was, it was seen as anti-slavery and that this was supposedly a huge motivation for a lot of the, uh, Southern, uh, Southern states, as well as, you know, even I guess the Northern states too, to secede. And this is why the American revolution is all rooted in slavery, et cetera. And that's just, that, that's just not uh, correct. Well, one, you have to look at actually how, you know, how, how, how colonists responded to this. If, if it was one grievance, it was one among many. And this is actually like, it wasn't at the top of the list. So this is what sometimes people don't understand that we might consider it very important, but they didn't consider it mm-hmm. very important. Uh, even if you look at the original Declaration of Independence, uh, it was actually pretty anti-slavery. Jefferson at least condemned King George uh, for the, the slave trade, um, and you can talk about whether or not that was a legitimate argument. But it was it was it was a step against anti-slavery. It was it was struck out though um, by uh, South Carolina and Georgia, as well as New England slave transporters. Jefferson also tried to. Uh, in the in the north in, in the in the ordinance of 1784, tried to stop the spread of slavery in the western uh, territories. Uh, so there were uh, you know just general anti-slavery um, uh, motivations for the American, partially for the American Revolution, it was not seen as pro-slavery. Even really in American politics, something I talk about, slavery wasn't actually that important of an issue really until Texas kind of burst on the scene. And there was the the controversy over annexing this independent country uh, that was seen as uh, extending the, the the spread of slavery. But yeah, the, the idea that slavery was a major motivating factor um, because some people in Britain said something is not true. Just look at the fact that the British Caribbean, a huge slave industry, uh, they were only able to end slavery after a very uh, after a, a compensation program in the 1830s. Uh, Britain, they sometimes said stuff to slaves like, oh, if you fight for us, then we'll grant you freedom in the American Revolution. They more often than not lied. Uh, and it was, you know, and you certainly had um, slaves fight for the Americans. It, it, it was not it was not a major uh, focus of the American Revolution, which is something a lot of people today have a hard time understanding. It was really uh, Americans wanted to break away. They did not mm. like the British government. Right. Do you have any thoughts? Um, and I don't want to like have you pick a fight with some that you haven't read their material, but I know, um, like I read an essay once from Mencius Molbug, and he, uh, I'm I'm paraphrasing here, folks, of course, but something along the lines of saying he's very provocative. I don't know if you're familiar with his writing, um, Patrick, but we, he was talking about the American Revolution. And he said something along the lines of they had this particular theory you know when you when you from our vantage point now when we go back and read like some of these rabble rousers and stuff like sam adams and whatever and patrick henry and the way they were he he called them the, i think the truthers of their day like the 9-11 truther and he and his point was they had this i this like conspiracy theory of oh my gosh the, the crown like they're trying to strip us of our liberties when it was like no they had to put this tax in place to fund, you know, the war that they just fought on the colonists' behalf to defend them from the French and blah, 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 or something. And so it was, anyway, I, I have heard that. So can you comment again? You're not responsible here. You're not yeah. directly attacking him. So 
if I'm old bug his fans hear this, I, you know, pick the fight with me, not Patrick. But in general, this the claim that yeah, we were taught to revere the founding fathers and everything, but actually, you know, what they they were kind of being strident and really flipping out over something that in the grand scheme it wasn't that big a deal. Yeah, so I I, I take the uh, I I do think there was a conspiracy. This is something that Rothbard talks about. And this isn't even like seen as a conspiracy. Yeah, like the, the British government they might have been saying different things, uh, but it was you know it was well known they wanted to increase uh, incrementally increase their various intervention over the American colonies. They had really tried to do this since the very beginning. A whole system of mercantilism, stressing they wanted the colonies to be raw export. Market, so you did. They didn't produce any manufactured goods. They sent all of their materials to England. England would produce it, and then you'd have to buy, you know, all sorts of stuff from England and all sorts of restrictions on, uh, you know, what ships, uh, goods could be transported on, uh, what products could be produced in the United States, uh, various taxes, taxes, etc. The issue is that throughout the 1600s and early 1700s, England was always preoccupied with other things. And in the early 1700s, uh, particularly uh, Robert Way, uh, Waypole, um, through Robert Waypole, who's really the first kind of prime minister in a sense, had this uh, policy of, of salutary neglect, which is that actually we're just going to kind of turn a blind eye. We're not going to enforce all of the regulations. We're going to allow smuggling to occur in the colonies, et cetera, because that's going to make us better off, right? They'll be more productive. After the French and Indian War, when, in, uh, when Great Britain had basically, they had become the world superpower. They took all the, the French possessions away in the United States, you know, in, in, in North America, or at least a lot of them. They, they, were, they were dominant. They said, hey, wait a second, we've been spending a lot of money uh, on these colonies. Now let's try to, um, you know, start to enforce all of our laws. This was sort of the grand design, right? And they initially did start off small. Um, taxation, at least by modern standards, wasn't onerous. Uh, by any means, but I think Americans correctly, they realized that this was an opening wedge. So what always happens with everything, and we see this today, is that, well, you know, we're just going to pass this policy, right? This bill. And then you give it a little bit, and then there's another thing, right? And it's, it's like, once you let the door through, you know, the infrastructure bill, uh, well, then there's going to be more infrastructure, right? And we've, we've literally just seen this over the past year because we passed an infrastructure bill early in the year. And now, of course, there's pleas for more and more. Uh, and so this was this was a big they, they they were fighting against that. So, yeah, they were being strident. But I also think it was it was rightfully so. Mm. An additional element that's also very important is in the 1750s. And a lot of this, this is when a lot of people really became uh, they, they really started to learn a lot about libertarian ideas. So it's like, like yeah, taxation is theft. Yeah. yeah, You know, and like, yeah, it's that's good. I, you know, I root for these people. So, yeah, I do think Great Britain was intentionally trying to impose a system uh, that they had not been able to impose since the beginning, but now since they were the world superpower, they were going to be able to impose it. But when they started to do so, America was, had grown too much. The people had got too much of a view of liberty and yeah, they were willing to fight back. And I think them fighting back, uh, was, uh, was, 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 was very, was very important. I do side with the Americans and not the British, I guess. Okay, great. Um, all right. Well, why don't we jump ahead to the issue of, uh, yeah, the Articles of Confederation, because of, of course, originally after the revolution, we didn't just jump right into the, the current structure of the federal government vis-a-vis -vis the states and so forth and, and trying to the U.S. Constitution. There were the Articles of Confederation. So why don't you just briefly just give the, the basics there for people who don't fully get that. And then, of course, the way it's taught in standard schools is, oh, the Articles, that what the central government didn't have enough power. There were all these problems. And so that's why, you know, the, the, the Americans, the sputting new nation decided soon into its, after its birth pangs that, you know, we needed a stronger federal government. And then these wise men wrote for the, you know, the federalist and giant thinkers such as James Madison and so forth. And this is now why we have, you know, uh -huh. the, the wonderful government of checks and balances that they bequeathed to us because those, pesky articles like you couldn't run a country with that crazy system <laughs> yeah so when when we seceded from great britain and you know which that's what it was it was secession um we had sort of 13 independent states that were created and they were informally allied and working together under what was known as the continental congress which is sort of like the the sort of the organizational body that was kind of conducting uh the war effort and all that stuff 
in the articles was actually pushed by, uh, in a sense, by the, the 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 forces of power, particularly those associated with this guy named Robert Morris, who's a very prominent financier and merchant in Philadelphia. He sort of was the, um, you could say the 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 the, the spiritual father of Alexander Hamilton. Okay, and they wanted a strong government, so there was a big fight over, you know, over. We said, all right, we want to break away from Great Britain. Do we want to actually have a limited government or we just want to have our own version of the British Empire that we would basically control? Right. So we want to have our own American empire. And of course, uh, Robert Morris and some people, the same people who were the most the least reluctant to break away. They some of them actually fought independence. They were in favor of having like building an American empire, an empire of power, which is something I, I described. And so they pushed the Articles of Confederation through or they tried to push the Articles of Confederation through. It used to be a lot stronger. Right. It actually got weakened severely. So the the end result in the Articles of Confederation is a fairly decentralized government where the Articles, the, 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 the central government, the Confederation Congress, as it was called, had some power. But um, it couldn't tax if they wanted to pass an amendment. Uh, you needed unanimity. So you needed all of the state. Uh, all of the states to agree. Um, there were various other proposals that, you know, legislation that required a supra majority. So not just a simple like 50 51 percent, but you needed uh, two thirds or, or three, three fourths, et cetera. Like that's, you know, classic super, super, supra majority. And so it, it really was only created at once all the states ratified the Articles of Confederation when the war was pretty much over. So we didn't even need it to actually uh, facilitate the war. But in the 1780s, it was it gets a lot of criticism. Uh, a lot of the problems in the 1780s, to the extent they existed, was just due to the fact that the war was very costly economically. And we had this massive burden of war debt after that governments were trying to repudiate and default on and get rid of, which is which is all great. And so I think the article is far better than the Constitution. I think the articles, if we had stuck with the articles, we would have broken up into probably three separate confederacies, you know, sort of informally linked together, which I think would have been would have been great. Uh, but the articles, is, uh, yeah, I, I, I think the, the articles by basically making it very hard to raise taxes, a lot of people consider that a weakness. I consider that a strength. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm pro articles. And in my book, I really describe sort of how the articles were, you know, they, they, they effectively constrained government power uh, in the 1780s. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I think it, what you just said, you, you had a quick line there sort of highlighting the different worldviews. I think a lot of Americans today and even like political thinkers and whatnot, if you said that, oh yeah, had they stuck with the articles, the colonies would have or, you know, they weren't colonies anymore. They, they would not have remained joined at the hip. They probably would have split off into maybe three separate, you know, nowadays we, there might be three different countries in where the existing 13 colonies had originally been. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people, then they would say, so you just proved the articles were a bad idea. Like that's the whole point is, you know, uh -huh. not only do we got to keep them together, but then we got to march westward and then we got to get Hawaii because that's, you know, written in Ecclesiastes that Hawaii should be part of the union of the United States. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, yeah, there, there's this sort of pre this, this preconceived notion that the United States was destined to just take over all of the land that it currently controls. So it's like, oh, yeah, we had to go all the way to the Pacific. Uh, this is just the only way it could have worked. Anything else would have been total anarchy or confusion. Um, that's just that's just not true. That's just simply people thinking bigger is better. Uh, and a, a lot of that sort of, uh, I guess you could say American ethos, you got to imagine it was, was, um, well, was, was, was born or really grew during kind of the world war two cold war era where they're like, well, I, I remember I was actually at freedom fest and I had to argue against some guy, uh, at least Mark Skousen was reading his, his, his comments. He was like, well, if, if, if we didn't have the constitution, if we didn't stick together, there's no way, uh, we, Hitler would have won world war two, you know, like. <laughs> well, this is, all right, so we're talking about the 1780s, and mm -hmm. we're saying something in the 17. You know, like there's a little bit of a leap. I, to I go promise you. Can I just you know, interrupt you, Patrick? Yeah, I promise you. I was gonna make a joke. I, I yeah. promise this is true. A, a minute ago, when you said that, and I was gonna say something like, "Well, if the country split apart back then, then you know, how would we have stopped Hitler? We'd all be speaking German." And someone literally said that to you. That's, yeah, that's someone funny. said, and I'm like, oh. 
<laughs> like, ah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you got me. I'm just, yeah, this is all like a camo, you know, plot. Yeah. But it, it's, it's really, uh, it, it is a important thing to, to, to note that you know, decentralization does actually promote liberty. When you look at how the United States grew, it was not through, you know, grew economically. It was not through greater government power. A lot of people talk about, oh, how in the articles you had states with competing tariffs against one another. So, you know, Georgians would have to pay uh, more from goods from South Carolina. That was actually false. The issue people had was that they couldn't agree to raise tariffs on foreign products. There was actually competition between the states because if one state had high tariffs, uh, basically they would lose commerce to other regions, right? So that was, it was very important. Or actually, when you have that sort of interstate or interjurisdictional competition, uh, that that's a big that that, that 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 that's a big benefit, right? That that's a that's a boon. Uh, it's a, it, it's it's not like this 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 weakness. And again, a lot of people, it was not preconceived among certain people that we would be, we would own all of the land. Thomas Jefferson, as well as other people, they, they thought even well into in like the 1800s when he was president, Thomas Jefferson thought that, well, oh, the, the people on the West Coast will be their own country because uh, you've got the Rocky Mountains, right, separating them. And, and it was a lot of, some people did think that, yeah, you, you could split up into multiple governments. The, I think the traditional would have been uh, something along the lines of New England and or the Mid-Atlantic. So that could have been one to two. Then you would have had the South. And more importantly, you would have also had the West, which was, uh, you know, and by the West, I'm referring to like the land around the Mississippi River, mm-hmm. right? Because before we had internal improvements, you, you shipped goods down to the Gulf of, uh, of, of Mexico. You didn't, you didn't ship goods, you know, so you, you, you're in Ohio, you're going to ship goods down South. You're not going to ship goods East through Pennsylvania. Well, if you had so Amazon just, prime, you, you could, yeah, 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 you could have, you could have got, could have gone Amazon prime or a drone, um, uh, to, to do it. Uh, but yeah, so like this is, it's, it's something that's, it's very important. It's to fight back people. It's this knee jerk reaction that like you, Oh yeah, well we had to just naturally take over all the land. Uh, that we took over and anything else would have Hitler would have won. You're like, well. <laughs> so um, let, let me ask you this for the, you know, the, the lens that you're using in your book with the cronyism, is there any particularly fun examples of like going from the articles to the constitution of how that wasn't merely a disagreement over in broad political philosophy, but there were special interests perhaps fueling that? Oh, yeah. So I, I go through this because I, I take a very negative view on the Constitution. I side with Rothbard. So I know this some libertarians take a positive view. I actually think our disagreements are are not as big as they seem because that limited government view of the Constitution was not from 1789. It really came from 1798. But that's a whole different story with Jefferson and any anti-federalists, et cetera. But there were various forces behind the Constitution uh, that – you know, you could see some cronyism. I mean, I could go through multiple examples. My favorite example is Washington or D.C., but it doesn't directly relate to the Constitution. Um, but even something like the contract clause, right? So this is something that we have sort of free market people. We say, oh, this is great. You know, the governments can't, can't uh, you know, interfere with various contracts along certain lines, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the original motivation was they didn't want uh, – a lot of people, land grants were a very big thing back in the day. So you'd lobby the government to give you a big land grant, and then you would own it. This was seen as very crony because you didn't settle the land, et cetera. The government didn't really even own the land and whatever. So this guy named James Wilson, he was a lawyer for Robert Morris. Uh, he ended up also becoming a Supreme Court uh, member, of, member of the Supreme Court. He also ended up uh, going to jail, but that's a whole different other funny story, uh, is that uh, he was he was very big promoting you know, the con- the contract clause in the uh, you know during the Constitutional Convention. And the idea was that with the contract clause, states would not be able to rescind land grants. So if one um, legislature gave out a land grant or something else, and then another legislature didn't like it, they couldn't rescind it. So it's kind of like once you got that cronyism, it's sort of uh, it's in, it's entrenched, right? It's mm-hmm. it's embedded. And this is this is so he pushes for this thing of the Constitution, right? 
And then in the 1790s, there was this Yazoo land scandal in Georgia, where really Georgia back then owned claim. This is kind of hard to imagine. Uh, they owned, they, they, they claimed ownership of Alabama and Mississippi, what became the states of Alabama and Mississippi, right? And so you had these various land speculators, these Yazoo land companies, uh, these, excuse me, these land companies. They tried to get the land near the, I think it's the Yazoo River or whatever. And this is in Alabama, Mississippi, et cetera. So they lobbied the Georgia, the Georgia government to get these literally these massive land grant for like cents on an acre, absolute, you know, minimum. They bribed the legislature. They did this is in Georgia. This is like 1795. And then when Georgia, Georgia people found out, they like blew a gasket because they said this is totally ridiculous. And they threw out uh, all the, the politicians involved with this. And then they rescind the land grants. But the issue was uh, – <laughs> Uh, guys like Alexander Hamilton and also James Wilson were arguing that, well, actually, you can't do that because of the contract clause, right? Mm -hmm. And what makes it even more hilarious is that James Wilson, the guy who was fighting for this at the Constitution, literally owned stock in some of the companies that uh, we, we, you know, that were benefiting from these large land grants. Right? Hey, he Which had is skin very, in the game. Skin in the game. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he had, he had skin. It's, it's, it's an incredibly blatant. Like, you're like, really? Because uh, things were seen. And this is something that's not always discussed is that uh, there, a lot of Supreme Court decisions were um, in many ways reflected based off of the own special interests of the actual chief justices in certain ways that we don't always understand. Our famous chief justice, John Marshall, mm -hmm. oh, he's a great, you know, the Federalist, all that stuff. Well, a lot of people don't realize is this. All right. He was also a huge land speculator. He worked with land speculator Robert Morris, right, the guy I mentioned before, who was also involved in the Yazoo lands, by the way, on a lot of deals. Robert, uh, excuse me, um, John Marshall's younger brother, James Marshall, married the daughter of Robert Morris, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, huh, I wonder, you know, I wonder how those those those, those Christmas parties are going to go, what, what type of business they're going to talk about, et cetera. And so, yeah, later on, he was influential in various rulings regarding the Yazoo lands, uh, the court case, I believe, was Fletcher v. Peck in like 1810, 1811, something like that, which basically legitimized those claims because Marshall also had other claims in, uh, in other parts of the country. Right. So by ruling favorably on the Yazoo lands, he would bolster his own land speculation, something a lot of people don't realize it gets covered up or if it gets discussed, it's like a sentence in a book. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa wait a second. You just mentioned this guy, his younger brother is married to the daughter of like one of the richest people in the country. Why don't we elaborate on that a little bit more? I don't mm -hmm. care about the rest of his family history, right? And so, there, yeah, there's tons of examples like that that I discuss in the book. Yeah. Okay. Why don't we, with the brief time we have left here, Patrick, if you don't mind, let's talk about um, Jackson. And mm -hmm. uh, so the way, okay, so I remember it was, I'm trying to even remember too. I think I even, for some reason, was against him when I was in high school because I was interpreting it as that he was anti-banks per se. Like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, because at this point, you know, I was just getting into libertarianism and free market economics. And so from reading his rhetoric, and then of course, the, the way he was presented in the history books or whatever is, oh, yeah, he was like a right-wing populist and he was against, you know, the forces of Wall Street and the bank and mm -hmm. what, and I think that I took it as, oh yeah, standard sort of like, like today's Democrats and they don't like b business and cause they're, you know, they don't understand that business helps the little guy too. And da, 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 da. and that's not exactly what was going on, was it? Yeah, no. So I, I do take a favorable view of Jackson. He certainly mm -hmm. had his flaws. Um, there's no doubt about that. Uh, I think his, the Jacksonians were more successful than the Jeffersonians at removing cronyism. That's a whole, you know, that's a related conversation, mm -hmm. but it's different. But when it comes to Jackson in particular, yeah, he, he had a very hard money view of the Constitution. Uh, he tried to argue the Constitution basically prohibited note issuing uh, banks and, you know, the, the paper money was was uh, was unconstitutional, et cetera. Uh, one of the things to realize, so yeah, he, he did not like the second bank of the United States. He was against his cronyism. He laid out various reasons for that. The second bank of the United States had all the government's deposits, which is a subsidy. It had a monopoly. So it had a monopoly on the interstate uh, banking. Uh, so interstate uh, branching and so on. Uh, Congress agreed not to charter, charter any other banks. It would make loans to various politicians. Uh, so on, so on and so forth. It would be used to encourage credit expansion and et cetera. Uh, 
this was sort of an evolving concept during his presidency, as well as in the presidency of Martin Van Buren and even beyond, is that, well, a lot of people didn't know exactly how to reform it. So this is something that is true in uh, free market economic thought, right? That uh, people were, they, they, they might not have liked government privilege, but they didn't know how to actually, particularly in money, they didn't know how to actually reform it. The big reason for this was that Adam Smith, who uh, was broadly, broadly free market, uh, you know, um, inspiration for, for, for a lot of Americans, he was not good on money too. And this led to a lot of, a lot of confusion. Um, but so the Jacksonians were against the bank, but they didn't know what to replace it with And their proposal, like an independent treasury, which was that you only have the government accept a uh, specie, right? So accept, don't accept banknotes, right? So to really in like an all, you know, for, 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 um, you know, tax collection and other sorts of payments. So that would totally separate, the banking system from the government that sometimes veered on what might have looked like a central bank. OK, even though it, it, it wasn't or the idea it turned out not to be a central bank, because that was sort of an evolving concept that Jackson himself was sort of working on trying to figure out. This is the exact same thing. If you know a lot about the currency school and the banking school, the exact same issues with uh, various reformers in Great Britain. You take something like Peel's Act. Right by Robert Peel, which was to we're going to end the business cycle uh, and all that stuff, and they've got this good reform, but they're like, all right, we're going to stop credit expansion and we're going to give a bunch of power to Bank of England. And you're like, <laughs> how does that work, right? And, and so, with the Americans, actually did better. The Independent Treasury was much better than Peel's Act. Uh, I think it was the Bank Charter Act of like 1844 or something like that. Um, then. Uh, that then the uh, uh, yeah so, so we were better than than the British but this was he wasn't against banks like it, it's it's an evolving concept of what exactly was laissez faire but I think Jackson was was one of our better presidents on monetary policy I mean I really do think that because he really tried to separate the government from the banking system and I, look I, I I value very highly he vetoed the reach the early rechart of the second bank of the United States mm-hmm. uh, and you know that. You know, I, I, I'd kill to have a president like that these days. He put, um, he had that on his tombstone, right? Well, I, 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 yeah, I think so. That's what people, I, that, I, I, I'm, I'm making a trip to go to the Hermitage, mm-hmm. Jackson's place in Tennessee. So I'll be able to verify that myself. But I've, I've heard that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, something like he had killed the bank or something. And yeah, he, I've been to the Hermit because when I lived in Nashville, I, I went out there. We actually, um, my business partner, Carl Slar and I, we had an event and then we, that was like one of the fun things we did after is we chartered a bus and took some of the attendees out there. And yeah, Jackson, he's, I, I like that guy a lot. I mean, so, you know, he, he killed too many people, you know, mm-hmm. so yeah. he, he killed yeah. more people than I would have. So I'm not saying yeah. he's, he's a, f- a flawless being, but um, yeah, in terms of just historical figures that, that had, uh, you know, an interesting character, he's got lots of stories about like, somebody insulting his wife and then he challenges the guy and takes a bullet first and then shoot, you know, I mean, he's, he was yeah. like total bad behind a man, if you know what I'm saying. And, uh, and then also too, we should mention, he literally paid off the national debt, not he balanced the budget in one fiscal year. He paid, he retired the debt. I mean, which is, yeah. I like yeah. using him, Patrick, when I argue with MMT people and some of their statements about how, Oh, the federal debt is just the flip side of like private saving and, you know, like the they make yeah. statements that tie them the supply of dollars itself to federal debt, and it's like so when Jackson paid off the debt, I guess there were no more dollars, and America just imploded, and that didn't happen. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, can you can you tell us though, uh, in terms of like the the crony element? So yeah, you're right. There's and folks, I'll link again. This is BobMurphyShow.com/slash two two four. Dan Sanchez, when he was at the Masons, wrote this great article called something like the 19th century Bernanke talking about Nicholas Biddle, who was uh-huh. the head of the second bank and just, yeah, the corruption involved when Jackson went to war with, you know, metaphorical war with that guy uh-huh. and how the guy literally was saying, well, I'm going to cause a, a depression, you know, uh-huh. and, and that and certain members of Congress were literally on the bank's payroll and say like the corruption was, you know, it was so naked. It was, it was, it was sort of shocking that you know, it was almost refreshing. Like, oh, back then they were pretty open about what they were doing. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nicholas Biddle, he's he's discussed in my book. I mean, because I talk a lot about the second bank of the United States. He sort of viewed himself as a uh, as, as like a Hamiltonian. He was very big on what was known as the American system, which is have a central bank to provide credit, stimulate businesses, protective tariffs, stimulate industry, internal improvements to stimulate commerce, bind the country together and all that stuff. And under his Leadership, the bank of the second bank of the United States, be uh, had developed a lot of links with politicians. Uh, Biddle would, during the bank war with Jackson, would lend money to politicians or to newspapers to have very favorable uh, bank, uh, you know, pro central banking articles, basically. And uh, he 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 clashed with with Jackson on this. Something I also talk about. Uh, this is something a lot of people don't know about Nicholas Biddle at all, is that he was actually very big in the Texas annexation movement. Uh, one of the things is he died young. He died in like the mid 1840s. Um, so this is why his sort of later years aren't always discussed. But he, as well as the second bank of the United States, when it became just a private bank, owned a lot of uh, depreciated Texas debt. So they bought it very low, you know, at a very, very, very low price, right? There's a high default risk. And there was this big, uh, just like during the 1780s, it was seen that, well, if we annex Texas, then uh, we're going to assume all their debt at par, right? So naturally, that should be a huge killing, courtesy of the U.S. taxpayers. You buy, you know, just like in Puerto Rico, you're going to buy the debt very low rates. And then if Puerto Rico ever becomes a state, you know, you know, the value of that debt's going to you know, go through the roof. And he was very big on Texas annexation. And he was also big on Texas annexation. And he convinced John Tyler of this, President John Tyler, was that if we annex Texas, we could have like a, co- a cotton monopoly, so to speak. Uh, so that's a whole different side thing about Nicholas Biddle. But so in a sense, sort of related to the bank, uh, just its financial investments. But yeah, I go through the bank a lot. I go through Nicholas Biddle a lot. Uh, he definitely... He's one of the bankers that does not come out well in my in my narrative, I'd say. OK, well, before we wrap up here, Patrick, is there any other like just fun example of cronyism and things that maybe people would have heard of from U.S. history that? Oh, and, and now, you know, the rest of the story. Is there any anything that comes yeah. to mind? Yeah, well, my, my knee jerk reaction, my knee jerk example I always go to when I'm like giving my elevator pitch for this mm-hmm. book is so I go through the location of the nation's capital. So George Washington, right? So most people, if you don't American history, you know that there was a, there was a compromise over the debt uh, issue, the assumption of state debts. And in Jefferson and Madison and Hamilton, they had a big powwow that had dinner uh, in, 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 out in Philly. And they said, all right, look, we'll assume the state's debts, but the capital's got to be somewhere on the Potomac aka somewhere kind of in the south, right? Maryland, Virginia, so the you know the Potomac River, right? So that was seen as sort of a balance of power. So it was like, okay. And they passed what was known as the Residence Act, and they gave Washington the ability to choose the cap where the capital would be in this small little box somewhere on the Potomac River, right? It was kind of like he's the president, you know, you, you get to choose it. So fast forward a year later to we're getting to the bank controversy. Hamilton's trying to push through the first bank of the United States, Jefferson's against. Washington wants Jefferson's opinion. He wants Ma- uh, Madison's opinion. He wants Hamilton's opinion, et cetera. After, even after Hamilton's uh, uh, very pro-bank defense, Washington was actually leaning towards vetoing the bill, particularly because the bank would be established in Philadelphia with a 20-year charter. And he's like, wait a second, the capital is supposed to move to D.C. in 10 years. So what are we secretly trying to create the capital in Philadelphia? The issue, though, was that Washington at the same time also wanted to move the, the choose the the, lo, the location of the capital outside of the box given. He wanted to put it next to all of his land in Alexandria, right? Huge increase in the real estate value. So Washington agreed to sign the bank bill and the Federalists agreed to amend the Residence Act. So in essence, Washington signed the bank bill uh, so he could put the nation's capital next to all of his real estate. So that's why Washington, D.C. is precisely where it is, because it's next to all this land. And you can see this now. I mean, his, his Mount Vernon estate is still there. It's still right outside of D.C. And if you go to it and he's got this huge highway, too. You think about it, the amount of land, like the, the real estate that could be constructed. on it, He's still he's still got control of this thing. But it's a blatant example of cronyism. The only reason we had our first bank really was in a sense because Washington wanted the value of his real estate to go up. If that's not cronyism, I don't know what is. <laughs> All right. Well, there's 
a great way to wrap up the discussion. So, yeah. uh, folks, my guest has been Patrick Newman. The book is Cronyism, Liberty Versus Power in Early America, 1607 to 1849, put out by the Mises Institute. For links on all this, folks, go to bobmurphyshow.com slash 224. And Patrick, thanks again for your time. Well, thank you so much for having me on. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit bobmurphyshow.com.